My dear parents, it's already been several times, dear parents, that in my letters I have asked you to do me a big favor and send me your beautiful pictures, photographs. I was also asking for this on behalf of dear sister Hannah, may she live, who hasn't seen your radiant likeness for eight years, and I don't know and can't begin to understand why you don't respond to me about this in your letters to me, dear parents. If it, to you it is a mere trifle and an insignificant matter, which, in your opinion, isn't worth writing about and isn't worth the paper, ink, and time, well, for me, and also for dear sister, it is a matter of greatest interest. Imagine the happiness it would bring me if every day when I got out of bed, I could look at your dear pictures. I would no longer consider myself lonely in this big, wide country. I would feel at home if my dear, beloved parents' pictures decorated and illuminated my lonely little room. The same goes for my dear sister, who would probably take the pleasure of having your beloved pictures in her house. Why won't you grant the wish of your children, whom you love and whom you want to be happy? We hope that this won't take too long and that we will have in our homes two beautiful and refined guests, that is, dear parents, your beautiful pictures, which are impatiently awaited. <laughs> Eliezer Kahan. I guess you gather that was a little bit over the top. Um, thank you for pointing that out. But what, the point that I want to start with is that this is not a real letter. This is a fake letter. Okay, so, you know, we start from there. Um, it was a fake letter from a book of fake letters. Um, believe it or not, um, this was a popular genre of his anthologies of fake letter books um, that people would buy. Um, in order either to read, you know, to find out about people's lives and how they missed each other and all that kind of stuff, or to practice reading, which is something we'll get to in a little while, or maybe even to use some of those, those ideas, right? If you're in the situation and you have parents who are abroad and you will never see them again and you need to write to them, how can you write to them in a weighty enough way that will make them cherish those letters, you don't have a, a lot of chances at it, right? I mean, you've got one chance. Um, so these were these little books um, in Yiddish, which is the language that we're dealing with. They're called Brievenstellers, but they had them in all cultures, and they had them all European cultures. Let me uh, make that correction. All European cultures. And they existed for hundreds of years, which was pretty startling to me. When, I, when we first started to write about this, I had never heard about them. So this is kind of the most popular genre that you have never heard of, um, unless, unless you're very special. Um, they said that, they, um, compa that the, these compilations had letters for all occasions. That was their advertisement. They really didn't. A very big part of them was business letters, um, uh, which are more interesting than you will think, would think, and which we will not inflict on you now, but we're going to show you at the end that, in fact, they're pretty interesting. So business letters, but also, more startlingly, letters for all sorts of private occasions, like the one you just heard, but also love letters, and also, for Jewish um, Brevenstellers, letters yelling at your adult children. Um, who have done who have done something wrong? Uh, yeah, I see people. People understand the impulse. But I was going to say, why did they have those things? But it looks like people understand why. I guess what you need, what we need to ask, is why write a letter in that situation? Well, obviously you had to write a letter because the people lived at a distance. If you're in America, obviously at a very great distance. But even since our story really starts in Eastern Europe, even if you're in Eastern Europe, um, and you need to write to your beloved. Uh, which would be in the short period between uh, when an engagement was signed, engagement contract was signed, and when the wedding occurred. Even if you had to do that, I mean, it's scary, right? I mean, put yourself in that situation. Um, you have to write a love letter, and you don't know the words to use, and you've got one shot at it. Um, so that's the general situation. What, for all cultures, um, what about the Jews? I think I've gotten into this a little bit already. The Jewish... Brievenstellers, as opposed to American letter writers, they're called the, the actual 
um, compilations are called Letter Dash Writer, and you can find them online. Trust me, you know if you get curious. Um, but the Jewish ones are very different. So if we, we did look at, the, at how they developed, um, comparing them to the environments in which Jews lived. So we started by looking at Russian language ones, and the Russian language ones are so formal. I mean, there, there's an arist it's an aristocratic, it was. Not anymore. But it was an aristocratic culture. And if these letters, if you're aspiring to something, you're going to aspire to the, you know, the behavior patterns of the aristocracy. So that's the kind of, that's what Russian letter writers are like, Yiddish not. Um, the American ones, all oh, the American ones are charming. I mean, go look them up, you'll see. They're, they're friendly. They're not aristocratic. They're reserved and friendly, and they understand that life has reversals, and they understand that you can have fun. All these good things. Not Jewish ones. The Jewish ones do not understand that you can have fun. <laughs> yeah, fun. You know, it's just not, it's just not there. Um, but what they do understand is anxiety. They understand, this is unfortunately true, I know it's like totally cliches, but you have to understand that this genre is a genre of cliches, right? So all the cliches are out there. Yes, they understand anxiety in its infinite varieties. And they, they kind of, you know, they're telling you what to do about this anxiety. And if you feel it and you're really anxious about your kid, here is a way to write that will elicit the response that you want, which is, oh, I'm okay, and I love you terribly, and I want your picture, something like that. So, um, yeah, I mean, these, these Brievenstellers arise. I'm going to go very briefly back to Eastern Europe now, to the Russian Empire, at a time when Jewish life, the life of, of the immigrants before they came, is changing really, really rapidly. Um, so that politics is happening, not that we see a lot of politics in here, you know, we have to really look with a magnifying glass because of censorship, but politics is happening. Immigration is happening. Um, you know, the ways in which <clears throat> romance goes on and marriages are contracted, you know, is changing very, very rapidly. And as we watch, we started the book about the 1880s and then moved in to the end of it around right before World War I. And you can see them change, not even from decade to decade, but maybe in five-year increments. So that's, that's um, really very cool um, to see. So what are they teaching? Um, one of the things that they're teaching is language, which means, um, well, I'm gonna, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna go back and give you a little bit of an example. Stay with me, I'm going to go back to the 1880s because for me, this example is so cool. So imagine that you're in the 1880s and you are a young man and you are in the elite, in the intellectual elite. So you have, you have finished or left yeshiva and you have this great religious education and you are even married, so that kind of business is behind you. But now, what do you have? You have a dowry and the idea is you have to invest that dowry, right? You have to go into business, that's what they did. Um, but you ha and you have to communicate by letter, and you have no idea how to do this. You totally have no idea how to do this. You have to write a letter in Yiddish. You have no practice, right? That was not what yeshivas are doing. You, you know this, right? That they were not engaged in that. So you suddenly need this practical instruction, and you might not only have to write in Yiddish. You might have to write in German the very beginning of our period, elite languages, right, sophisticated language. Or you might have to write in Russian, or believe it or not, even in Hebrew, you have no idea how to do it, so what do you do? You turn to a Briefensteller, and they have just letter after letter of those things. The other thing that it will teach you is how to translate. That's how they learn foreign languages, right? They would have bilingual editions, and here you have your Yiddish, whew, what a relief, you know, and on the other side is a language that you need to learn. And we know from memoirs that people actually did it that way. So, um, yeah, that's our young man. But let's take a different young man. He's in worse situation. So he's about to get married, and we're still in a, a period of... Um, because we're remember in the elite, we'll leave the elite very soon, but that's where we are right now. And there are, he's in an arranged marriage, and you know he's just contracted that marriage, and now um, the fashion has dictated that he's got to write a letter to his, I don't know, can I say beloved? Probably not, fiance. So he's got to write a letter to her. This is scary stuff, because one of the things he has not been doing in yeshiva is learning how to write love letters. I mean, a little bit more than you think, these people, some of them, were sneaking novels, 
primarily in German, sometimes in Russian, under, you know, underneath their desks. But he had to write a letter to a young woman of the elite who, believe it or not, was reading a lot of novels because she did not have to have a religious education, so she had a considerable more freedom. Well, he is stuck. I mean, you know, imagine you're in this situation. It's really scary. And worse than that is that that letter probably is going to be read aloud to her parents. Um, yeah, you know, they need to see that their investment has paid off, right? And, and so you have, to, you have to write in an educated way. This is very frightening stuff. And one place that you can turn is to a Briefenstellers. So these early Briefenstellers had basically two things, love letters, um, varying in, you know, from very restrained to quite passionate. Um, that's, I guess, for her and not for her parents. But anyway, love letters and also business letters. Um, but you know, times change, and times change very rapidly. Um, and pretty soon, the Briefenstiller begins to be marketed to an entirely different group, and that's the group, of course, who eventually, some of them, come to the United States. These are people who are ill-educated. Um, and in order to set a, a little bit of a picture of this, I have to tell you what I learned, what we both learned, um, about the Jewish educational system, because, I mean, um, had I been sitting in this audience before we did the book, I would have known that the Jews had this, the first in the world, actually, system of compulsory and free, um, if, if you couldn't afford it, education for men, uh, which is actually pretty impressive. Um, and this educational system did a bunch of things, and it did it really well, did them really well. Like, it, it got... Um, Jews as a group to um, respect texts. It got men, including very poor men, um, to be able to read through the prayer service, which is a big deal. Um, uh, but the one thing that it didn't, and then, oh, the other thing it did was to um, select out elites, even from poor young men, um, to go to yeshiva. So there was this, um, it was a kind of meritocracy, an intellectual meritocracy this way. So all these things it did. But obvious, one thing it did do was it didn't teach you to write. And I mean, it did not teach you to make letters. You know, like this, this first grade kind of stuff, to, to form letters. Because that was not necessary for, um, um, if, either for prayer or even to um, taking part in religious discourse. You just didn't have to do it. Um, so uh, people who had the money hired schreibers, which are, you know, uh, uh, teach private tutors to teach writing. They use letters, by the way, to teach. But if you didn't, you were stuck. And by the time we're talking, like around 1900, um, the Jewish population in Eastern Europe were, was really getting impoverished, which is one of the reasons that they came here. Um, and all of these impoverished people who were working in sweatshops and stuff like that, something like 17 to 18% declared themselves not to be literate or not to be able to write, which is very low in, by the standards of the Russian Empire, where it's totally, it's completely reversed. About 17, 18% were literate. But for Jews, this was terrible. And the thing is, because the, the culture is so text-based, they were anguished. They were distraught. And one way that they learned literacy was through these Briefenstellers. So that's really cool. I mean, they have the alphabet. They have it written out. Obviously, they don't tell you how the letters sound. They had no sound component. They couldn't. Um, but they did teach you um, the basics. So I think I can even... I can even stop. Oh, no, I, I have to say one last thing, and then we'll do the next letter. The last thing is about women. We're going to hear a whole lot about women. I was talking about men, right, and how the, um, how, uh, the uh, educational system helped and on occasion failed men, but it totally failed. Well, no. There were elite women. If you were a wealthy girl, you went through school. If you were a, a girl, your parents had some means, you had a private tutor, but if you didn't, then you had nothing. And it's not like these young women didn't want to learn. They wanted desperately to learn. We actually saw a memoir um, where we ran a memoir where, uh, um, I don't know, there are a lot of memoirs, not to waste a lot of time, but there are a considerable number of memoirs you, where you can see that young women learned to read, which was so important to them, and to write by writing these letters in Briefenstellers, like the one we just heard, over and over and over. Oh, okay, your turn. 
Sure. Talk too long. Um, yeah, we are going to get to another letter very soon. Uh, um, one of the things that um, it might be important to say is that most of the grievance tales we read were published in Europe in the Russian Empire. We looked at ones that were published from the beginning of the 19th century, which is really when they began, to about World War I when they died out. Because after that, um, in um, Poland and in Russia, um, there, there were more formal avenues to learning how to read. Um, but there were a few, um, out of the 50 or so that we read, about five of them were published in America. And at first we sort of were wondering why, um, why would you need a Yiddish um, letter manual here, but there, there are obvious reasons. You still have to write to people back home who, um, who um, are not gonna be speaking English. You yourself don't know English very well yet, let's say. And, um, uh, and even though you were you know, Americanizing maybe more rapidly than you would be Russifying in the Russian Empire because things are a little more open here, um, you still, um, there were still enclaves like here where Yiddish was the dominant language, you were still doing business in Yiddish. And um, what's really interesting is the differences in the ways in which America is portrayed in the American books and in the Russian books. That was a big surprise because you think that almost everybody everywhere was in terms in the Jewish world was portraying America as the golden Medina, the golden land in glowing terms. But that surprisingly was not usually the case. So the um, next Julian is going to read a letter from a, um, the, the letter that we've called in our book, I thought that gold rolled around in the streets. It was published in Berdichev in 1890. Um, but before that, I'm going to give you a little taste, just a little taste of how the original Yiddish um, sounds. So bear with me. Um, because actually, we, it, our book, it's all English translations that we did. So here is a taste of that letter. So um, even if you know Yiddish, that might be sounding very strange because it was a very formal um, uh, Yiddish with um, um, Hebrew phrases mixed in in these letters. Um, it was considered very good form to write that way. And also um, frequently a very um, um, kind of highfalutin Germanized kind of Yiddish as well. But um, now let's let Julian read the letter in translation. So, to my dear and pious mother, Miss Rachel, may she live, may you live to age 120. First of all, I want to let you know, dear mother, that on December 20th, I arrived safely in New York and immediately looked around. And what a bad deal I made, because, <laughs> because I didn't take your advice and let myself be misled by superficial people and believed that in America, gold rolled around in the streets and one only had to bend down and pick it up. In the end, I saw that it is not like that at all. Of course, this is a very free land where the Jew has all the same human rights as any other nationality, but in order to cross over into such a distant part of the world, he must store up more than just patience. In order to come to the decision to become separated almost forever from the land of his birth, where every bit of land, every blade of grass, every tree is beloved, and to never again have the opportunity to see his parents and acquaintances, not to mention all the hard hardships. One must learn the language spoken in every neighborhood and also learn to specialize in a profession. But it is so particularly bad for me right now that I can't write to you, dear mother, about my situation at all. First of all, because I don't want to cause you too much suffering. <laughs> and secondly, because I don't have the time right now. 
Only, dear mother, I ask you to please have mercy on me and forgive me for my impulsiveness and give me some advice about how I can come back to Russia. And please write me a reply immediately. From me, your son who awaits your reply, Arn. Um, actually, that letter has a little bit of a positive spin on it that a lot of the other letters from, that are about America in these journals don't. It says, there's one line that says, America is a free land you know, for, for Jews. Um, and usually, um, almost always, America is portrayed in the European Yiddish Briefenstellers as um, a kind of a purgatory for bad boys who hadn't studied properly and didn't listen to their parents and had to go to America because they couldn't find work in industrializing um, Russia. Um, but, um, and is, you know, and America is usually portrayed as a terrible place where people, you know, are, uh, are slave away from, you know, dawn to dusk. And um, it's not those that surprising that America is portrayed this way in those books. Um, a lot of them were written by Jewish intellectuals. Either they were members of what's called the Haskalah, it's sometimes referred to as the Jewish Enlightenment, um, or they were the next generation who had absorbed a lot of those ideas. And those intellectuals were very engaged with the idea of modernizing Jews. Um, and, um, but their, the vision of how that was to be done focused very much on um, a solution that, that was based in Europe, that Jews were going to um, educate, become more educated, learn to speak Russian, learn to speak German, and um, modernize themselves on the spot. Um, or some of them were Zionists, um, some of them were, um, were socialists, um, and these were seen as the avenues towards um, improving the lot of the Jewish people in the future. Um, America wasn't really on their radar screens at all. Um, America was considered a kind of backwater, um, certainly you know, not an intellectual center of Jewish life, though at the time it was becoming a cultural center. You know, it was becoming the center of Yiddish theater because Yiddish theater was, was pretty much outlawed in the Russian Empire. Um, but um, they... Um, you know, but so you actually find very little about America in these these letter writing manuals, um, even though it was a mass phenomenon at the very time that these things were being written. Millions of Jews were leaving the Russian Empire, um, at least a couple of million, you know, um, during that time period, and um, and going to America, going to other places too, but a lot, you know, to here to America, and um, so. Um, so there are, um, and, and you could, I guess, write about immigration. It didn't seem to be censored entirely, but um, you wouldn't want to get into the reasons why people were leaving the Russian Empire in droves, especially Jews. So Alice alluded to the fact that you also don't read a lot about politics um, in, um, in, these, in these books, because that was censored. So even though there were also lots and lots of um, young Jews, let's say, joining the anti-Zarist revolutionary movement, you're certainly not going to see that, you know, um, here. So um, while these, these Briefenstellers paint a picture of social realities, there's a lot that's like left out, and there's also a particular, you have to sort of read between the lines of, um, of you know, um, uh, and think about who's writing them and for who. So, um, but, um, so, but we'll see that um, America is portrayed very differently in the books that were published here. Then it's a whole different story. So I, let's go on to the next letter, um, which is also, I think, one that Julian's going to read, though we will get to Alex. Um, and it's, um, here, no one is ashamed of honest work. And I think I'll sort of alternate and not read the Yiddish for every one of them. Okay. To my wife, Mrs. Hanna, may she live. I am writing to tell you that I have arrived safely in New York. I suffered a great deal on the ship, just like everyone else who is unaccustomed to the sea air. I am now based at your brother-in-law's, and after I have rested up a bit, I will also begin to look around for a way to make a living. 
I hope that God, blessed be he, will help me, and that I will, if God wills it, find something at which to make a success here. I have run into Haim Yekel, Gruna's son. You wouldn't recognize him at all. He is quite the aristocrat, goes around in a fine coat and a top hat, and already speaks German and English. He earns bars of gold. Borek doesn't have it too badly either. True, one must slave away beyond one's strength, but something can come of it. I also won't be lazy. I won't be embarrassed to do anything, because here, one isn't ashamed to do any sort of work. Only thievery is a disgrace. But honest, hard work is free and open to everyone. And that's what's really good about America. If only back at home, people wouldn't be ashamed to do everything. It would be America by us, too. But among us, the only thing that matters is whether someone is a person of good family, a high-class person, and that is why people starve to death. I don't have any news to write you. In the meantime, I am sending you a money order for 15 rubles that I borrowed, and that I will, if God wills it, pay back, because I know full well that I left you without a kopeck. Your husband, who wishes you much happiness, Haim Yoina. So I, I, I can, oops. Yeah, I, I gather that you, you caught some of the fun stuff that's going on in that letter. I mean, did you notice that Haim Yekel speaks German, which he found very useful um, in New York? Is, I, I don't know what that's doing in there. And the bars of gold, probably also an exaggeration. What you might not have caught... Um, because you have to maybe know a little bit more about the old country, is that there's quite a veiled social criticism, right, of society, and it, you, you did see that. Of, uh, and that was okay, because it's a criticism of specifically Jewish mores um, in the old country as opposed to American ones. So the question is, how would you feel if you were, what's her name? Ruchel? Sarah, Hannah. If you were Hannah and you got a letter like that, happy? No? Well, she replies, and I am going, yes, because, you know, these are like little novels, not very good novels, you know, <laughs> but, you know, but they have this, this kind of, you know, entertainment fictional impulse, and it's also instructional. I mean, if you're looking at it from a kind of self-help, like if, you know, you could be him, and you're in New York, and you have to write to her, and, you know... You've left her without a kopeck, so what the heck do you say? Um, or on the other hand, you could be her. She's also got a book. And what do you say? So this is what she says. She's really mad. I'm going to get it. Give me a second. Oh, you have it? Yeah. All right. All right, this is, this is her. You can't say that women um, don't have a role in this. Should she write? To my husband, the shining star of his generation, Chaim Yoyna, <laughs> may he flourish. Your letter saying that you have arrived there safely has given me great pleasure, and I received the 15 rubles, but what good will it do? What should I pay first? Rent needs to be paid, the children need to be clothed, and we have to eat too. God will certainly have mercy on us and will send us his aid, but you not, must not forget God. You must serve him with all your heart, and he will certainly help you. I tell you, if only you had listened to me, you wouldn't have gone to America. You could have lived here too. We could have eked out a living here. People don't make a fortune in America. America either. A lot of people come back from there empty-handed. May God grant that you will not regret it and that you will earn a lot of money and will soon come back home safe and sound. From me, your wife, who wishes you life and happiness. <laughs> Hana, P.S. Yankala and Chayala send you their warm regards. <laughs> Meaning, you have kids here, <laughs> you know, don't forget you have children here. Pretty cool, no? I mean, what need I say? That's... It's, it's great stuff. So, um, but what, where this does bring us um, is uh, to the topic of women in America. Um, women have a very different life in America than men do, as the next letter shows. You ready yeah. to read it? In America, girls don't need a dowry. And I'll read just a little piece of it in Yiddish. Is this on? Okay. Meine liebe Freundin Rochel, ich hab dir versprechen, von Amerika Brief zu schreiben und dich bekannt machen mit der riesigen Welt und mein Versprechen will ich erfüllen. My dear friend Ruckel, I promised to write you a letter from America 
and acquaint you with the world here, and I will keep that promise. I am now sending you my first letter. First of all, I want to tell you, dear friend, that I really miss you and all of our friends, and even really miss our small shtetl, which is a flea compared to New York City. I must admit that New York is worth marveling at. If a person had a hundred eyes, they wouldn't get sated from looking at the exquisite things that can be seen here. But a person who has to break his head over making a living, a person who is lacking even the most essential things, doesn't think of looking at even the most beautiful, most precious, and exquisite marvels. You know what kind of situation I left back home, and with what a bitter heart I parted from my dear parents and from all my relatives and acquaintances. You know, dear friend, that I didn't leave for the new world for fun, but out of need. I didn't want to be a burden on my parents any longer. I couldn't watch them suffer, and so I decided to seek my fortune by going to America. Maybe I will be able to earn money and support them, my impoverished parents, as much as possible. You know what kind of ideas our shtetl residents have of America? They think that gold can be scraped up from the streets with shovels because Hayam Yekel the tailor, who couldn't earn a piece of dry bread in our shtetl, sent no less than 200 rubles to his Hana Devoira in his first year in America. And Hasia, the shopkeeper's daughter, Bela, sent her mother money for a wig and a coat. In our shtetl, they think that everyone in America lives like kings and, beautiful, and they live in beautiful palaces with the most expensive furniture and that we ride around in carriages. But when they get here, they see how mistaken they were. It is true that in New York, one can earn money faster than in our shtetlok, but one must bitterly and strenuously slave away. The working classes here don't live in palaces, but in stifling, airless little rooms. The only bit of luck is that the American ruble, our dollar, is worth two of our Russian ones. And when Hayham Yekel, the tailor, saved up a hundred dollars, it became two hundred rubles in Russia. But even though an American dollar is worth two of our rubles, in America it isn't worth more than one ruble. And while in our shtetl one can live well on three rubles a week, in New York one needs at least fifteen dollars, that is thirty rubles, to live well because first of all rent is very high and secondly everything is more expensive than back home. Here girls work as hard as the young men do. All the factories are packed with girls who work there and they must work very hard for the few dollars a week that they get. When for example you hear that a girl here makes ten dollars a week, that's twenty rubles, you would think that she can have a good time with all that money or that she can save up a lot of money. But you again would be mistaken. It is barely enough for her to clothe herself in a manner suitable for life in America or to buy herself a little enjoyment. But despite all of this, I must admit that America is a blessed land. Whoever wants to work can make something of themselves. America also has the advantage that the majority of girls don't need a dowry. As long as the girl isn't ugly or, and she's respectable, she can easily find a groom who will take her as she is. I have started to work. I make very little and work very hard. Sometimes I'm angry at myself for coming here, but seeing the progress made by other girls who came here as unfortunate as I am, seeing how many poor, lonely girls have gotten married to a very respectable men and today are wealthy, I am more encouraged and hope that I too will attain good fortune. I must end this letter because it's late at night and I have to get up very early in the morning to run to work. Live well, dear friend. I have done my duty and have written you a letter. And now you must do your duty and make your true friend happy with a letter. Leah Goldberg. Yeah. So, the, um, so the thing that really strikes me about that letter is it's to a girlfriend, right? We have lots of letters from children in New York. You heard one at the beginning, right? To their parents in the old country. Um, they don't tell the truth. The girlfriend gets the truth. Um, and sometimes, because these, as I said, they're kind of semi-fictional, you have the same character. I, I think it's the case for this letter. You have the same character who's writing a letter to her parents, and you can see the way she explains her situation there, and then to a girlfriend. So things haven't changed, as I could see. Um, you, you gathered all that much. Hey, that's exactly what these um, books you know, were doing. They were giving you pointers on what's appropriate to write to who. Yeah. Um, so the other thing that you need to know, like I would like to tell you anyway, is that there was this huge reversal um, in the relationship between children and parents in the old country 
and then after emigration into the United States. I, I mean, I guess it's pretty obvious, but we really, it really hit us when we read the letters. So the, um, the letters um, in Briefenstellers that are published in the Russian Empire are all from parents, and the parents are obsessed with their children. <laughs> Why not? Um, but there, it, it all runs... The, the anxiety runs from parent to child, right? The parent is terribly worried about misbehaving young men who are, you know, they're, you know I know exactly what they're doing because always, they always have the same sense. They're smoking on Shabbos. Um, they're hanging out with the wrong crowd. You know, they're sometimes losing that kind of thing. They're not studying well. Um, they're wasting their time. And they're not doing business. At any rate, parents are just terrified and they send letters and letters and letters and letters and when the children reply it's always oh you know every, it's going to be all right you know <laughs> like i'm i'm okay i'm really going to start studying now and you know the the idea that i was smoking on shabbos that was the servant who who said that i actually never that kind of thing so it's all one direction when the children get to new york they start behaving they're, they're very anxious for their parents Right, because they won't have any contact with them again. Um, and th they start writing letters as the letter that we read first, which you would never, ever um, see back in Europe. Um, uh, just the other thing that I wanted to point out, which you probably also saw, is the tremendous new freedom that this young woman has in the United States. Right, She gets to, say, to, to create her own dowry. She can choose. She would not have had that opportunity before. She can choose. Her parents aren't around. This whole idea of, um, uh, of genealogy, right, of, of who your, uh, you know, of family ties influencing who you can and can't marry, that's no longer quite the case in the United States. And she, she, as long as she's not ugly, as long as she's kind of normal looking, she's going to get what she wants. So this is, I mean, there's just a tremendous amount of freedom um, in that. They're all very positive. However, um, from the point of view of those parents back home, maybe a little too much freedom. And we see worried letters about that, too. Sure. Lutz, June 28, 1898. Hanala, my child, I have received your letter of June 15th. I kissed the paper in which I recognized my daughter's handwriting. I even kissed the envelope with its American stamp. The American stamp. It made me realize that my daughter, my sweet Hanala, is in America, on the other side of the ocean, at the end of the world. <laughs> When did I ever imagine that my beloved child would end up so far away from me that I would lose the hope of seeing her? But no, 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 I won't think of such things. I will hope that I will yet live to see my daughter at least one more time, to hug her and kiss her pretty cheeks one more time. You have delighted me, my child, with the news that you are, thank God, in good health and that you hope to find your good fortune in the new world because you are being courted by many gallant young gentlemen. To tell the truth, the expression, many gallant young gentlemen, leaves a bad taste in my mouth. <laughs> I would have been more pleased if you had written me that one gallant young man was seeking to win your love, because from many young gentlemen, a young girl's head can spin so that she doesn't know what to do, whom to choose from among them. My child. Do you understand that a young girl must be careful these days when she is surrounded by many suitors? Are you familiar with the sort of people that most of these suitors tend to be? Oh, I must admit that I've just asked you a very stupid question. How would you know about such things? You are still a young child. You were brought up in a small shtetl, and you are still unskilled in the ways of the wider world. So I consider it my responsibility, my child, to make you aware of a few important matters that can help you protect yourself against great misfortune. 
You should know, my daughter, that big city young gentlemen are not stingy with their compliments to a pretty girl. Most of them, most of them do not really mean the words that come out of their mouths so that you shouldn't believe every one of them. Even if one of them kneels before you and swears that his love for you is great and eternal, you should thoroughly, very thoroughly investigate whether his vow is true because there are many scoundrels in the world who, in order to attain their own dark ends, will not hesitate to swear to anything. Thing. And when you are finally convinced that a young man sincerely loves you and truly intends to marry you, you must, first of all, know how to deal with him. Don't give yourself over completely into his hands. You must use all your resources to make sure that he won't lose respect for you, because love without respect will very quickly come to an end. He must respect you, and this you can only pull off if you hold him at a certain distance from yourself. <laughs> These sorts of things shouldn't be written about in detail, but I believe that a smart child like you will understand the sense of my words. I wait with the greatest impatience to hear news of your engagement <laughs> to a fiance who is worthy of possessing you. Write to me often, my daughter, very often, so that with your letters you will delight your mother who thinks always only of you. Devoira. Um, Alex is going to read another letter, actually, just in, the, in a minute here. Um, as Alice was saying, it's really no accident that a fair number of letters in both the European letter writers and the American Jewish ones deal with women. Um, and it's not always as lighthearted a tale as the one we just heard. Here's a letter from an American Briefensteller published in 1910, and it's a good example of how these letter manuals really did reflect, um, often reflect real social realities. So this is one that we entitled, An Abandoned Wife Writes to a Rabbi in Minsk. Worthy Rabbi Yankov Meyer Gradinsky, Minsk. Hearing of your good and renowned name and that you were loyal and devoted to your sacred religious work, I am sure that you will certainly have compassion for a lonely woman like me whose husband left her with three children two years ago and who hasn't heard from him or gotten any information about him the entire time. But two months ago, I learned from a letter sent to me by an acquaintance in Minsk that my husband, whom she also knows, is in Minsk and that she ran into him there strolling in the governor's garden and that he, so it seems, tried to hide from her. But of course she stopped him and asked him what he was doing in Europe right now. He gave her some sort of evasive reply and then disappeared. Please, honorable rabbi, publicize this in your synagogues and in the Minsk newspapers. His particulars are, his name is Moish Rubin, he is 41 years old, he's not tall in stature, a brunette, and he is a heavy-set man with a trimmed beard, and maybe by now he has completely shaved even that off. If this costs anything, write to me, and I will gladly send you the money on the next occasion. Yours, Sivia Rubin. So the plight that that letter depicts was actually one experienced by um, hundreds of immigrant women. Um, there was even an organization established in 1905 called the National Desertion Bureau. Um, and I think in the forwards had a feature, um, I can't remember exactly, it was called something like the gallery of you know, disappeared men or missing, um, the gallery of missing husbands, where they would post pictures of guys who had skipped out on their wives. And um, I guess readers were encouraged to write in if they'd seen these fellows you know, somewhere. Um, and once in a while, they were missing wives. Okay, yeah, yeah. And, and actually, that just as a side thing, this, the, this letter also um, hints at something that, um, uh, another phenomenon, that some immigrants went back. They didn't stay here. Much less so, I believe, than other immigrant groups, but it still did happen in larger numbers than, than most people believe. Um, so, you know, you can see that migration in, um, in the Russian Empire, people also moving to cities, so there were a lot of letters um, where people worried about how their kids were acting in Warsaw, not only in New York, but in Warsaw and other big cities. Um, but um, uh, you know, it, there was a real threat to the cohesiveness of the family. 
but they're also a threat to Jewish traditions and the integrity of Jewish religious, Jewish communal life. And um, the, suddenly you have Jews living far away, not only from parental authority, but also from a rabbinical authority. And there were new modern ideas that were a threat to Jewish traditions. So there's, for instance, there's a whole series of letters in the American um, Briefenstellers about matchmakers, um, shadrins or shadronim, and um, and all of them are with they're, they're all of them de defending their right to exist basically in modern times. Um, so here's a reply from one young man who seems to be convinced <coughs> that matchmakers still are a good idea. Yeah. Are you gonna read the other? Okay. Worthy Herr Teichgang. I have received your letter and I can assure you that I am not one of those idiots who would be embarrassed to marry a beautiful girl by way of a matchmaker. I must tell you that I am very happy with the opportunity you are now giving me to have an intermediary in such an important matter. About the match that you have proposed to me. I must tell you, worthy sir, there is no way that I will decide to take even a single step forward until there is honest clarification about the following points. One, whether the bride is really beautiful. Two, whether she possess, possesses, in fact, the necessary training that every housewife must have. I'm not looking for anyone highly educated. First of all, and first of all, in my opinion, a woman doesn't need to be too preoccupied with books. Secondly, she should consider housework her priority rather than higher education. Three, is she a good housekeeper? Can she cook and sew? Four, is she not too fond of ostentatious finery? Five, does she fantasize about a life of luxury? Because no man can guarantee it. That depends on good luck. If I become rich, of course, I will see to it that my wife has every delight. And if God forbid I'm poor, she should be content with what her husband has. Six, does she really come from a good family? Seven, whether her parents will at least provide her with a fine dowry. If you assure me that all these seven conditions are met, I will start to work on it. Respectfully, D. Goldsmith. Strangely enough, in the European books, there already are no real letters about um, Shachonim, about traditional matchmakers. There are only jokes about them. And um, I think um, it's um, your colleague, Sharon Fries, who's written that, um, uh, you know, despite what you think, really actually matchmakers, that kind of thing, died out like much, much, much earlier than we think. In the mid-19th mid century, it was already considered kind of old-fashioned, kind of ridiculous, you know, and unseemly. Um, so um, so it's, it's kind of interesting that you only find um, letters from matchmakers you know, here in New York, and you kind of wonder what these, you know, people we've been thinking of, you know, by setting up shop here. Um, but in a way, it sort of makes sense because in the, um, even though you didn't, uh, you had courtship being modernized in Europe, you still had your parents there to make matches for you. Here, you didn't have that. So these matchmakers were, were, fu were fulfilling a role. Um, so, um, there's a lot of anxiety about Jewish traditions in the, um, even in the European manuals, because as I said, things were kind of splitting apart, communities were scattering, um, people were moving into the cities, um, but here it's particularly pronounced, there are a whole lot of letters in the five American um, manuals um, that speak to this kind of anxiety, and um, for, in the most spectacular one, which you can read in our book, is one in which one immigrant is accusing another of having a Christmas tree in his house and is about ready to keel over with, you know, uh, um, with shock about this. So um, I guess we have time to move on to business, which you were going to talk about a little bit, Alice. One, one business letter um, to wind up. I'm, um, you know what a business letter should sound like, right? You know, kind of terse, formal, you know, restrained, friendly. Um, I don't think I have to do anything except wait for a Yiddish one to be read. Absolutely. Air Alexandrov, I have decided to write you a third time. 
I always prefer the calm and peaceful way over quarreling, and you know that I have supported you during bad times, and that I gave you credit during the period when you were out of work because I had compassion for you. But you know that I am not a wealthy man and that I am a poor storekeeper who slaves away with his last feeble strength from morning until night in order to make a living. Very little of it has come from you. You owe me $65. For me, this is quite a bit. You've been working for a year already and are making a fine living. I have written you about the debt a few times already and you have ignored me. I must now write to you for the last time to say that if you don't reply to this letter, I will take you to court and will seek justice. I hope that you will decide to avoid strife. More to Ziegelson. Okay, so I'm in this business of taking him to court. That's America, um, as you can see. But the, the kind of personal relationship um, that comes through in these uh, business letters that goes th through the genre pretty much from, the, from its beginning in Europe um, straight until these letter writing manuals were no longer bought. I think we can conclude now, but I should tell you why they stopped being bought. You could figure it out yourselves. Um, it's public education, right? I mean, I mean it, it, if you actually have the opportunity to go to public school, um, then you really don't need letter manuals to help you out, and I think we should all be grateful for that, but they're fun to read. So I, we're happy that you listened and absolutely ready to take any questions that you might have. Can I just ask you to come up to the microphone here? Is that all right? Oh, that one. If you can just stand here. There you go. Hi. Uh, I have two questions, if I may. Uh, so first, uh, I haven't read your book, which I regret now, uh, but it looks like the letters that the talented actors read are authentic. They have specifics of those people's lives. There is no way that could be in the manual that is the subject of your book, so I can't reconcile that. Uh, <laughs> My second question, yeah, uh, you, you, you can answer it. Uh, so my second question, uh, even though I haven't read your book, uh, I just Googled a review in uh, uh, a Jewish book press. The reviewer says that you demonstrate in your book that the manual span the gap between religious and secular education. So I'm wondering, as a modern progressive and open with secular Jew, what exactly you meant by that? Thank you. Uh, let me answer the, maybe the first one, which is um, uh, a lot of these books were actually written by frustrated novelists and playwrights. Um, at least some of them were written by teachers, actually. But, um, but um, most, I even think most of the ones that we read from today were um, were written by a um, were, were written a book by a playwright who was best known as Shomer, who was a very very popular Yiddish playwright, and he wrote this book and a few other um, similar letter writing manuals because it was like a cash cow. It was it was lucrative. Some publisher convinced him to do it, um, so he brought a novelistic sensibility a playwright sensibility, and as Alice was saying, he wrote like little novels. Do you want to take the second question? The second, oh, you mean about education, the gap? Yeah, I was starting to, I, I tried to outline that, basically because the religious education that these people got, or didn't get, um, gave them no way to um, penetrate secular society. It didn't give them the skills. Uh, that they needed. That was, I think, what the reviewer must have meant. So that if they wanted to write a business letter, if they wanted to write a family letter, if they were unsure of their literacy, they needed one of these books. That, that, was, the, that was what was meant by the gap in education. Um, I'll Um, not like the, 
Okay. The question is, um, were there any of these books that had real letters in them that were actually written and sent back and forth um, between real people? Um, no, these were all made up letters. Um, I, I should say, I'm, I'm, someone probably is going to ask it, but I'll answer it before the question is asked. Um, what did, did real Yiddish letters resemble these in any way? And um, the answer is yes and no. We never found any evidence. I've actually translated a lot of private Yiddish letters um, written in the same era. And um, we've never found any evidence that people actually use these to copy from. But the one thing that you do find is that um, real Yiddish letters are very emotional you know, and, and full of guilt tripping and all this kind of stuff, just like these letters. So it was, what was, it's just fascinating because obviously it, it, it marks, as Alice was saying, these letters um, off from the letters of other, or the letter manuals of other cultures. Um, so um, high emotionality was, a, um, was obviously culturally sanctioned. I have a letter from my uh, great-great-grandfather, um, and he's uh, beseeching um, for his seven children who just became motherless over in Poland for them. And I come from a Jewish family, so um, it was written in Polish, and I think there was a Yiddish version as well, and he uh, is begging them to come over. In fact, he says, I have money, I have uh, their letters to prove that they just became motherless, and I'm... Uh, very afraid of what will happen to them if uh, anything should happen. And he is um, the owner of Silverman and Sons uh, men's pants. If anyone wants to to see this or whatnot, but uh, but it was it, it has like moments where he's you could hear how sad he is. So it's definitely, but it's definitely uh, professional in a way because he's he's uh, saying. I have all of these things that are listed. I, I'm a very honorable man. Um, and my sons, in fact, uh, have served in the army. So there's there's several things that he tries to prove that he um, has gone through all the, the hoops to have uh, his children come over. So. So what happened? So they made it over. They did, and they were successful. Um, and uh, some of them did go back, um, and some of them were lost in the Holocaust because um, some decided that they did not like America. <laughs> Unfortunately, they ha didn't have the sight to see until it was too late. Um, but uh, many did come over, and that's why I'm here. <laughs> so, anyways, yeah. Anyone Thank you. You answered my original one, which was who actually wrote these. Um, but I, following up to that, I wanted to know were there certain writers who were much more popular than others, whose books went, were sold much more than other writers? And the other thing is, um, what was the time period we're talking about here? Because the immigration was from about 1880 to about 18, 1924. When did the books stop being printed? That is such a um, well, I'll take the second part of the question first. Um, we, they, they actually were, they started to be published early in the 19th century before there really was a mass immigration, but there's still other things happening. People were, were still moving away and, you know, to cities and there was still a need to write business letters then. Um, but the genre, along with a lot of other works of Yiddish literature, kind of took off in the late 19th century. Um, when there were all sudden a lot more Yiddish books of all types being um, printed and published. And um, there were a couple of briefing shows that were published after World War I, but they were mostly just like second editions of things that had been published before. It really was World War I, that was it. After that, it was over um, because um, um, in cert, you know, the Russian Empire was then um, had been kind of split with Jew, the Pale of Settlement, you know, so Jews were, some Jews were living in the Polish Republic where there certainly, there was a compulsory 
education for everybody, actually. So they either were going to Polish schools or Yiddish schools or religious schools. Um, and um, other Jews were in the Soviet Union, and they were, there were Yiddish schools there for a while, but, um, but or some of them were going to Russian schools at that point. So they didn't need, um, they had formal education. They didn't need these books anymore. And uh, do you want to do the first part about the... Oh, some I do. More, I oh, I do. do. <laughs> yeah. um, yes. Um, some authors were more popular than others, and one of the things that amused us tremendously was to discover the phenomenon of branding. Um, so how do we know this? We know this because there would be, like, Schomer, the uh, playwright that Roberta was talking about. Um, he became a name, like Webster's Dictionary. I mean, and there were editions of Schomer's Briefensteller coming out after Schomer's death. Um, it, so, you know, he had a name that sold. Uh, uh, there are also uh, lots of phenomena of texts moving from one Briefensteller to another um, without attribution. You know, here they show up with one author's name and then they come out um, uh, under the name of, of, of another writer. So, um, yes, obviously, here's what I can't figure out. Um, I can't figure out that, it, I mean, from what I understand, I mean, people would go into small shops to pick these up or, you know, in horse-drawn carriages that would cart around libraries. I couldn't believe, still can't, that there was all that much of a choice, right, that would make branding a kind of good idea. Um, but that they branded, that's certainly the case. There was a sort of heyday of these things from, like, the 1890s to about, you know, 1910, where there were several different... Um, I mean, we saw 50 different titles, actually, so that's a fair amount of them. And that's not counting um, editions, just 50 separate titles. Um, and um, one of the other popular authors was Euser Blo Blostein, who was a um, kind of a pulp novelist a bit. I don't know if he's a pulp novelist, but he's a popular novelist. And, um, oh, and he definitely had... He, it, like about 20 years after you know he died, there was still a book saying blow strains, you know, you know improved Briefensteller. Oh yeah, the so second forth. editions yeah. were always new, improved. Mm -hmm. Yeah, <laughs> just like the dictionary. Mm -hmm. For a very interesting talk, um, I wanted to ask: Were there Jewish Briefensteller for the Jewish people who live in the shtetl, and for the non-Jewish people, the peasants or whoever? who wanted to write letters, that they have their own kind of letter writer. And the second part is, how can you be sure that the letter writer was writing what you wanted him to write? How, come, how do you know that he wasn't adding some things that you didn't tell him to say? When you say letter writer, do you mean a, a scribe? Well, Briefensteller were books. That wasn't, no, that would be a Schreiber. A Briefensteller is the book. Oh, the book is Yeah, so the book is a book. It's a closed thing. It's not going to... But the person who wrote... Who well, wrote that's a, a different thing. We didn't talk about that at all. Oh, okay. Um, there were these people that, um, that um, you could hire to write a letter if you couldn't write a letter, um, and, and they were known as um, Schreibers. Those, that was also the name of someone you might hire to teach your children how to write, a special class of teacher who would just teach writing. Um, and as a matter of fact, at least one book has an introduction that says, um, if you get this book, you'll be able to write your own letters and you won't have to parade your private business in front of you know, a strange person who's like writing. Let it might tell other people. Um, as for the other part of your question, yes, all, these were for Jews. Brilliant, it's the Yiddish word. So these were just marketed to Jews. Um, but American letter writers, that's what those books were called, were marketed. Yeah, they were, they're called letter writers. And that's, that live there? No, no, I, I, that's a terrible word, but that's the word they used. It, it's the, the word for the book that in English that we're calling a Briefensteller is in English a letter writer. It's just a, an a adjective, letter, like a letter, letter manual. writing manual. Yeah. But they called like so and so's oh, letter, letter writer dash manual. writer. It wasn't an no, it wasn't a person. It was letter a real. Writer. Yeah, I'm sorry. That was I didn't make up that title. That's that's their title. Um, and then in Russia, it wasn't marketed to peasants. Peasants in this era were just illiterate, um, and they didn't write um, letters to each other. But lower middle class people in cities um, did have these books marketed to them. They're called pismovniki. And they exist. They were and Russian. Who, who yeah. Would you translate. 
when they got letters from their relatives from the state. But that, if we're talking about. Those letters for them. It's a Yiddish. Oh, well, if, if people were writing in Yiddish back from America, they wrote you know. Yiddish both ways. Yeah, sure, because they came here and they had to write well, to I their parents. So, in, yeah. in English and when they they, sometimes they did. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I actually, when I was reading real letters sent back to a Lithuanian shtetl, um, it, it became clear that after just like a little while here, people's Yiddish got kind of, you know, mixed in with a lot of English words. So sometimes, you know, um, you saw things like, I didn't really understand what do you mean by you know, boss, you know, or something, you know, because like these words were kind of thrown in. Or sometimes the thing I loved the best was somebody's old father you know, back in the shell, sort to incorporate those words into his own letters, you know, like English words, things he had never been to America for sure. You know, um, he wanted to be, I, it was neat, you know, he wanted to show his son how, you know, with it, you know, he was. Thank you so much. Um, I just had a question. Um, I was just thinking about the Yiddish newspapers and that at the turn of the century in the first decade, people started to, some people started to compare like the editors of the Yiddish newspapers to the, the roles that the rabbis used to have. So in the sense that people were going to the newspapers, to the editors with questions and having their questions answered there because the rabbis couldn't. And it strikes me that these letter writers in some ways are also fulfilling that role in, in that they're giving people advice on how to do day-to-day -day things in a new country. And my, I was wondering um, whether Italian immigrants in America had a similar thing, or German immigrants in America, was there something similar in those populations? You no, know, I think that we, when we were doing this research, we focused a lot on Europe, because that was where most of the books were written. So we did certain kind of comparative um, readings, but mostly they tended to be with Russian letter manuals published there. Um, American ones or English ones, um, and um, German, also you looked at, at German. We also, there's somebody wrote a book about Hebrew language letter manuals, which had a whole different other purpose and were for a, you know, a much a, a more elite kind of readership, really. So, um, so that was a, that's an interesting question, whether there was, and there were any Italian language or German language. Um, equivalents published here. The books were actually published there and not published here? There and here. There were a few published here, and most of them, some of them got reprinted here. And the Hebrew no. Publishing Company, right? The, the Hebrew Publishing Company, there was something called Star Publishing Company also, um, and, uh, but, and at least one of them is this famous guy I mentioned, Blostein, it was for some reason republished here as Steinberg's, Dr. Steinberg's um, <laughs> previous show, but it's exactly, is a completely plea copy of the European book. One more question. Were any of these writers women? Because I know there was Mrs. Hess. Or were, well, that even isn't even the in our The elusive Mrs. Okay. Hess. Um, the, we don't know who she was. The question is, were, a, were any of the writers women? And no, in one that we didn't actually include in our study, though we mentioned in our bibliography, it was one of those Hebrew, well, there was, there was another whole thing. Um, a lot of these books are miscatalogued in libraries. Um, and there's some things that are cataloged as Yiddish, and they're not really Yiddish. They sort of look like Yiddish, but they're really German in, um, in, in the Hebrew alphabet. Um, and so they're kind of similar to this, but if, as you look at them, you see that they're really um, high German, you know, in, in Yiddish, the Yiddish alphabet, and they had a specific purpose, to wean people away from Yiddish. Um, and so they, they were kind of an anti-Yiddish. So we didn't um, include those, and one of those, which was, I think, a quadrilingual, you know, manual, it was Russian and, you know, this Judeo-Deutsch, um, Judeo-German, um, and Hebrew, and I think there was, what else was there? Russian, no. he, maybe it was trilingual. All right. Hebrew. It was trilingual. Um, yeah, and there was it had a list of authors, um, including a famous Moschial, um, Paperna, um, and it also had Mrs. Hess listed. She helped. She helped write. She the probably book, wrote the know. whole thing. But we. Yeah, yeah, no yeah idea. maybe she wrote the whole thing. <laughs> well, I 
Um, well, we both actually worked on the Evo Encyclopedia, and we met each other then. And, um, and I had originally wanted to do a book about real Yiddish letters, which would be kind of a hard project to do, because you, know, you would be kind of limited by just what accidentally fell into your hands. Um, and then, I don't remember, but like at some point we discovered that there were these books, and, and, and we realized that no one had ever read them before. Um, and it's a pretty modest little genre, but very <laughs> but fun. fascinating, you know, and fun. So all the letters in your book are, are made up letters? They're all fake. They're all you from books of made up letters. We didn't, we didn't make them up. Real books <laughs> of fake letters. <laughs> Real <laughs> fake letters. <laughs> we, didn't, we didn't personally make them up. Then. So, Th thank you all very much. Thank you very much. We do have um, the real fake letters in a real book, really for sale, <laughs> tonight. And they will really sign the books. Um, if you buy them tonight at the museum, you get a 15% discount. Um, and we uh, encourage you to support the program by doing that. We also encourage you to get memberships to the museum and come and visit us. Um, and I want to thank our actors and our authors for their brilliant work tonight. Thank you. Also, <laughs> I don't want to omit that if you, one of, one of the other kinds of advice literature that was written at the time in Yiddish in this neighborhood were cookbooks written by women, uh, particularly one named Hinda Amchanitsky, and we did a whole program on her about a year ago. Um, but Hinda Amchanitsky also ran a restaurant um, on, I think, Rucker or Canal, and it's no longer open. However, Russ and Daughters is open down the block, <laughs> and they offer, uh, I think, a 10% discount with the purchase of a book from the shop. So you have a double incentive to get your book, get it signed, then go to Russ and Daughters. Um, but um, thank you so much for coming tonight to the museum, and we hope to see you again. Um, and good night. <laughs> thank you very much. That was beautiful.